Philippi and the Ghost It was far past midnight. Cassius and Brutus had now met, and with the armies which they had recruited were in camp in Thrace. And Brutus was exhausted. The air in his tent was dead and chill as the fog crept into it. Words danced and blurred on the page before him, but he read on, driving himself feverishly, as he had been doing day and night for weeks. Suddenly the lamp flickered. He looked up. Through the haze of light his eyes traveled toward the flap of his tent and stopped. "'Who are you?' he gasped in a hoarse whisper. "'What do you want?' He was rigid with horror as the ghost drew nearer. "'I am your evil genius,' he heard the specter say. "'You will see me again at Philippi, at Philippi,' he whispered, and then he was gone. "'Philippi,' Brutus shuddered. Philippi was the town in Macedonia where he and Cassius were to camp and prepare for battle against Antony and Octavian. They were in Thrace on their way to Philippi. Next morning Cassius laughed scornfully at the story of the ghost, but Brutus could not shake off the chill of it. It clung to him like cold fingers on his neck. Philippi proved an easy place to fortify. Brutus and Cassius were there in early autumn, 42 B.C., and were well fortified when Antony and the first troops arrived from Rome. The main road ran through a narrow plain between two long, high hills. Cassius had taken the hill near the sea, Brutus the opposite hill, and across the low plain between them they had built a string of earthworks. Looking the situation over, Antony saw that a steep rock cliff protected the far side of Brutus's camp, and an impassable swamp lay between Cassius and the sea. Octavian, arriving ten days later, found Antony making plans to build a road across the swamp. For ten days after they had landed in Greece, Octavian had been too ill to move, but as soon as possible he had insisted on being carried to Philippi in his litter. He made his camp opposite to Brutus, as Antony's was opposite to that of Cassius. For a month the armies faced each other, all four men growing increasingly nervous as the days went by. Each day Antony and Octavian were expecting their supply ships from Rome. Each day they did not come. Day by day the need for them increased. His evil genius haunted Brutus. Birds of prey worried Cassius. He could scoff at ghosts, but birds of prey flying over one's camp were another matter. They were an evil omen. Finally, Brutus, unable to stand the suspense any longer, set a day for the battle. Cassius wanted to postpone it. A swarm of bees, he said, had settled on one of his standards. In the face of that, no one ought to undertake a battle. But Brutus insisted. They met in the morning of the appointed day to discuss the final plans. If the battle should go against us, what do you propose? asked Cassius, his thin nose looking very pinched and drawn. I once thought, said Brutus, that killing oneself was a cowardly and irreligious act. But now I am of a different mind. If providence does not favor us today, I am resolved to die, content with having given my life for my country. The purification ceremony and sacrifice, customary before any battle, was then performed for the soldiers. Cassius, still uneasy, became more so when the garland which he was supposed to wear was handed to him upside down. That was bad enough, but when the officer walking in front of him with the image of victory stumbled and dropped it to the ground, Cassius was ready to back out, but then it was too late. Before anyone was quite prepared for it, the battle began, a battle that might be called a tragedy of errors. The first mistake was made by Brutus's soldiers who started forward in a rush toward the enemy lines before Cassius's men were ready. 
even before their own officers had given the signal. Part of them, plunging ahead, divided from the others, passed around the left wing of Octavian's forces, and on into his camp. There, after slaughtering the soldiers left on guard, they came upon Octavian's litter. Piercing it savagely with their pikes and darts, they left him for dead and set to plundering the camp. Their arms were full when Brutus caught up with them. Their mistake, although profitable to them, was disastrous for the soldiers of Cassius. Antony was down superintending his road across the swamp when the battle started, but his left wing joined the right wing of Octavian forces, also without their leader. Together, they rushed against the soldiers of Cassius, sent them scattering in retreat, captured Cassius's camp, and began scooping up the plunder. Cassius himself had escaped. Unable to keep his forces together, he and a small personal guard had fled to the top of a more distant hill that overlooked the plain. Judging by his own defeat, Cassius supposed that Brutus had also been defeated. Brutus, on the other hand, judging by his own success, believed that Cassius had been victorious, and so sent no help to him. In time, being unable from where he stood, to make out why Cassius's camp looked so peculiar, Brutus sent over a company of horsemen. Cassius, standing on the small hill, squinting back across the plain, saw the company of horsemen galloping in the dust, and mistook them for the enemy. Not completely sure, he sent one of his officers to investigate. The man soon saw who the soldiers were, and they, in turn, recognized him, and they were so glad to see him alive that they completely surrounded him. But, to nearsighted Cassius, it looked as if he had just been captured by the enemy. Great Jupiter, he cried, how could I now love life so well as to live on? Come, he said grimly to the freedmen whom he always kept with him in battle for just such an emergency. Strike, he said, pulling his cloak over his head and making his neck bare. Strike, he told him, the time has come to die. The cavalry riding up and Brutus following later found the freedmen gone and Cassius dead, his head severed from his body. The officer stabbed himself in remorse and Brutus wept. Then, sending Cassius's body to be buried outside of camp, he rallied all the remaining soldiers and, during the following days, reorganized them. These, together with his own, he promised a large sum of money. Also, if they behaved themselves and were victorious, he told them that instead of merely an army camp, they might have two entire cities in Greece to plunder, rob, and pillage to their heart's content. Such a happy thought. After dark on the night of the battle, to Antony's surprise, Octavian turned up alive. He had been warned by the bad dream of a friend and urged to leave camp in the early morning, so his litter had been empty. He was alive, but shivering and half ill as usual. Antony's camp was too near the swamp for comfort. It was cold for October, and the tents were pitched in mud and puddles of half-frozen water. They could not stay there long. As soon as the supply ships came, they must attack Brutus, Antony said and defeat him. They waited another twenty days for the supplies to come, and then learned that they would never come. The ships had been destroyed at sea. That night, without further delay, Antony announced to the men that the battle would begin the following day. In that night, Brutus saw his evil genius again. This time it did not speak, just floated into his tent and out, like the cold breath of the fog. Brutus would never see it again, nor would he see another night. The next day was to be his last. His forces met with complete defeat. A few brave soldiers remained to defend their leader, but most of them fled before Antony's opposing legions. It was about three in the afternoon when the attack began. 
Long after dark, about midnight, a small group of dark figures sat on a rock beside a brook deep in the woods. Brutus was bemoaning bitterly those who were not with them, those friends who had been lost in the battle. The man beside him slipped down, dipped his helmet in the brook, and handed him a drink of water. They continued to watch for one who had gone to see what had become of their camp. He was to signal with his torch if he got through. There was no signal. Far above, the sky was bright with stars. At their feet, the brook gurgled. Occasionally, someone spoke, then relapsed into silence. Brutus made a quiet request of one and then another, which each seemed to refuse. He sat silent for a time, leaning on his hand. At length he spoke. He thanked them for their loyalty. He said he was angry at Providence only for his country's sake. For my own, I think myself happier than my conquerors. I go, leaving a reputation of virtue. They will be condemned by posterity for having seized a power to which they had no right. He rose then, gave his right hand to each in farewell, walked a little way apart from them. He drew his sword, and holding the hilt firmly in both hands, fell upon it and killed himself. After daylight had come, they found his dead body, the soldiers, Antony and Octavian. As they stood there, Octavian remarked, with a thin, cold voice, that he wished the head sent to Rome to be placed at the foot of Caesar's statue. Anthony shook his head as he stood looking down upon the quiet figure with a sort of puzzled wonder and a certain respect. On buckling the clasp of his scarlet general's cloak, he slipped it off and with it covered the dead Brutus.